During my first year of travel, I had fulfilled what I set out to do. I'd had the most epic adventures and I'd also started making all these travel films and documentaries. Everything just kind of came together in this moment during my life. The power of YouTube and Instagram um, was phenomenal. It, it still is, but at this time it just felt like it was a real sort of like ice hockey curve where it just took off. I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, but yeah, it was really, it was something special at the time um, because it changed the game for creatives. They were places where thousands of people could see my work for free. Like all I had to do was click upload or post and that was it. Um, and it really it changed the game for creatives because it removed the middlemen, got rid of the gatekeepers. It, it democratised creativity, if that makes sense. Just before I finished my first year in Australia, I took a trip up to Leon and Cathy's. Uh, Leon is Melissa, my auntie Melissa's dad, and he owned a place up in the hills, like deep in the Australian bush. What made you decide or choose to live here and in this way? <laughs> That's a very good question. I've never liked being in the city. Never liked the hustle and bustle. The dirt and the, and the crowds and no, never. And the only way to avoid that was to come here. These guys lived a fascinating life. Um, they were completely self-sustainable. Um, they were just living off, off their own means. The majority of the trees here were all planted by Leon and his family when they first bought the land. Meanwhile, the garden outside is an oasis full of fruit and vegetables. This is the bed that'll get turned over again shortly. And this will be our autumn plant of broccoli, uh, cabbage, cauliflower. These are table tomatoes, these here. These first dozen uh, sticks. Carrots, green onions, basil, lettuces, thyme, beetroot, cucumbers, just the watermelons there. Lemon trees and lime trees, grapefruit trees. That's the non-impact on planet Earth. To me that's, that's almost an ideal way to live. Well, I did what came naturally at this time. I, I just wanted to capture that story because it was so interesting and unique. And this, this was a, felt like a really natural progression. At first, as you saw in the last video with like the Hong Kong stuff and those early Australia videos, I was just making sort of like sweet little travel cuts with a bit of music. Visually, I thought they looked okay. Um, and that was really nice because as I said, it allowed me to flex my creative muscles. But at this point, I was starting to realize there wasn't much to them, you know? There wasn't, there wasn't much substance. Um, and I came to the realization that I wanted to do a bit more and try and tell more of a story. Generating, we're still using electricity, but we're not doing it with fossil fuels. It's all coming out of the reusing the water over and over. At a waterfall next to the house, Leon saw the potential for something amazing. At the top is a catch pond connected to a pipe laid by Leon. Comes down that pipe through the manifold and into the turbine. The flow of water then drives magnetic plates on the turbine at the bottom of the waterfall. We tip it over. This is what the water drives, it's this magnetic plate, there's magnets on there, they're in banks of four, four north, four south, four north, four south, and as they pass under that massive copper wiring, just on a thousand revolutions a minute, you get excitation, and that's where the electricity is generated, and then goes up to the transmission line to the battery base. This turbine generates double the amount of electricity that Leon and Kathy need for free without any impact on the environment.
I wanted, I wanted to do more with my filmmaking skills and I wanted to tell stories and this is what that video was, it was storytelling. I really loved it. Do you think we've reached a point where the damage is too much? We've Maybe the turning point? It, the, the turning point's long gone. Every action, there's a reaction. For everything we do, there's a consequence. We can all survive with less, Josh. You see, it's your, it's your group. You're, you're the ones who are going to sit on the cusp of this. You're on the cusp now. Is it going to go over and go down? Can you pull it back? I don't know. It'll happen in your time. That happened in my time. How are you? I'm tired. The next part of the progression for me was like this whole journey of like figuring it out. Um, it was when I went back home to the UK after my first year in Australia. After a few weeks of catching up with friends and family, you know, all the usual stuff, me and my friends booked a flight to Iceland. Good morning. It is 5.30 a.m. We're in Manchester Airport and today we are flying to Iceland. Should be a little bit cold. There was a huge tourism boom in Iceland at the time and like, literally everyone on Instagram seemed to be going there. So naturally I was seeing all these incredible photos and videos of this beautiful landscape um, which blew my mind and I was like, I, I want to go there, I want to see it for myself. <laughs> so we did just that. We flew into Reykjavik and hired a car and we spent the next week driving right around the island on the ring road. It was insane, like truly mind-blowing. Oh my god. Mate, this is insane. It's fucking ridiculous. Oh my god. From the waterfalls, to the glaciers, to the black sand beaches, a lot of the time it felt like you were on another planet. Our first stop of the day was the infamous plane crash. The one you've seen a thousand times from a thousand different photographers on Instagram. To reach it, you had to walk 40 minutes out across this vast expanse of black volcanic ash. The landscape here was mind blowing. It made me feel like I was genuinely exploring on another planet. The plane could have quite easily been a downed space shuttle. It was like something from Interstellar. Again, like the Great Ocean Road, it was one of my favourite trips because it was just good mates, good songs, in a car, having an adventure, surrounded by stunning nature. There's really nothing more that I could want. I think there are very, very few places where you can just pull over and find scenery as stunning as this. This is unreal and it's everywhere. <laughs> the snow's quite deep as well. This is insane. here um, that I had one of my most profound moments, a moment that really stands out to me. Um, it was one evening, early evening, we arrived at a place called Jokulsalen Glacial Lagoon. Jokulsalen? I'm so bad at names, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, we arrived at this glacial lagoon. It was basically a place where this huge glacier was dumping all of the ice it was carving. Um, 
and it was just it, there are no words it quite literally took my breath away <laughs> oh my god it had already been an epic day seeing waterfalls the black sand beach the crash plane and this was like the perfect icing on the top the perfect ice I flew my drone and got some really beautiful shots that was over the moon about. Everything kind of just got me. <laughs> I became really emotional. Unreal. Wow. I am like blown away by how beautiful this place is. This is probably the most beautiful place I've been on earth. This country is amazing. I had, I'd never seen something so beautiful and I became overwhelmed because I realized that this was it. This right here was, this is what I wanted to do, you know? I, I cracked it. This is what I want to do, like, the rest of my life. I want to be traveling and making films. That's it. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> ah, man. I had I'd found my thing, you know? This is exactly what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be traveling and I wanted to be telling stories. That That's what felt right to me. Um, and I can't remember being that happy for, for ages. It was a really, really beautiful moment. And the reason I love this moment so much is because it shows exactly where I was at this point. Um, because I'd realised what I wanted to do, but I still had a long way to go. The rest of my life. I want to be traveling and making films. That wind, like, the wind pretty much ruins this clip. Like, very, very close to completely destroying this beautiful moment if it wasn't for the subtitles. Um, it just goes to show that I, I was still an amateur, you know? I was using cheap equipment. I didn't have a microphone. I was just using what was in the camera, which is why the wind completely destroys the audio. Um, yeah, it just shows where I was at this moment in time. I came away from Iceland with more great memories, a new travel series for my YouTube, a better understanding of what it takes to film travel documentaries, including a few drone crashes, and a growing sense of what I really wanted to do in life. After Iceland, I then flew to Malawi in Africa. It seems a little bit random, but I had been here several years before, back when I was in university. I'd helped out volunteering at this orphanage. Here I am with the sun in my eyes. Uh, I am finally at Mangochi Orphanage and Education... Mangochi Orphanage Education and Training School. So yeah, finally here. Uh, it's taken a while. 
and this is the main area. And that is Patterson, the director. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm going to show you around, uh, show you all the buildings, everything they do here. It's amazing, it's a lot. Um, I didn't expect that much, but it's actually, you'll see, it's crazy what they do here, it's so good. So yeah, I'm having a good week so far. I'll show you around. Whilst I was in Australia, I'd received an email from the charity that helps run the school and they basically asked me for help and they were wondering if there's anything I could do. Um, and I decided to take a risk and head back there because I, f I figured, well, I could make a film to try and help you make more money, raise more money. So yeah, I, I headed out there on a whim, really. It felt, it felt right for me to do that because I remember the first time I went there was quite an experience for me. Welcome to Malawi. I am in a place called Mangochi. It's on the shores of Lake Malawi, which is a stunning, beautiful lake in Africa. Um, I've actually been here before. I came here in 2014 and I was volunteering at a local school called Mangochi Orphans Education and Training School or Moet for short. Um, so yeah, that was in 2014. I have like a lot of memories which have stuck with me from that trip. It was an amazing trip. And there was what there was one in particular. Um, so we went to went to a local hospital one day and that was that was the first time I was confronted with the realities of living in a third world country. There were there were kids in front of me, screaming, crying in pain, and dying. And I remember that was really, really tough for me. Like, I'd never seen that before in real life. Like, yeah, you see it on the TV, Red Nose Day, whatever. But, like, that was the first time it was there in front of me, and it was horrible. Um, and I remember feeling really, really, like, helpless, useless. Like there was nothing I could do, and it was actually so bad that I had to, I had to leave the hospital because I just wasn't prepared for it and I didn't know what to do. Um, so yeah, now I'm back a few years later because I figured out how I can help, and I can help by sharing and telling stories through film. And I've come back to the school to make a film about Moet. My name is Patterson Mujolanga. I'm the founder and executive director for Margot Conference Education and Training. So it's an institution that started on the grass that shelled a hamlet in 1999 with 10 orphans. It is called Moet in short, and the objective for starting this institution were one, to give quality elementary education to orphans and other children and also to provide vocational skills training, to provide uh, settlement school sponsorship to those children who are actually uh, you know, graduating from the primary school. But also to help the orphans and their guardians in living lightly on the planet, living a simple life by using the concept that is known as permaculture. And um, from the time this school started with the orphans, we have seen a very tremendous change and a very encouraging progress because from a grass that shelter, this time around we are saying that we have a full primary school with the 345 children and um, we have about 11 teachers whom we are working with right now. For three weeks, I would ride my bike to the school every day and shoot this documentary that I was kind of making up as I went along. It was a beautiful part of the world. I would often wake up early to watch the sunrise on the shores of Lake Malawi before I started the day, and the people were so friendly and kind. There's a reason it's nicknamed the Warm Heart of Africa. Dear my friend, I'm living now, and that train is passing by. Do take me with my body over there, yeah, yeah. To the land of paradise, 
where you will be no surprise, no sorrow, no. It was fun because there was the guarantee that every day would be different. based the documentary on an interview with Patterson who talked through the history of the school and the challenges they faced. Malawi is one of the very poorest countries in the world. The students at Mowat face incredibly difficult circumstances every day. The orphans that we have here are really challenged because there are a lot of you know, things that they need for them to stay very well. This area that we are staying it's a, uh, an area where there are a lot of mosquitoes. So uh, the children, most of them suffer from malaria. Like, for example, this time around when the rains have just stopped, there are a lot of stagnant water everywhere, and there is a lot of cases of malaria. And uh, we normally register this time around about six or seven children going to the hospital every day. But also the issue of the households where they are coming from. Most of the households are dilapidated. The houses that we need when it's raining, sometimes they don't sleep. They just stand up because it's raining heavily. And when it rains very badly, sometimes the houses fall down because they're made of mud and thatched with grass. But apart from that, um, the problem that we have is that many children come to school when they are hungry. It's very rare for parents to prepare breakfast lunch and supper because of the minimal resources which they have. The food that they eat is really very bad. Uh, bad in the sense that it's not nutritious. They just eat provided they have to, uh, you know, put the, have their bellies filled. Feel. But also the um, clothes, the clothes that they have. Maybe some have only one pair of clothes, the right uniform. It's these problems that Moet is helping to tackle. Malawi was a real eye-opener for me because it made me realise that I could, I could use my skills as a filmmaker to, to help others um, and that was really important as a good lesson and understanding for me. It was also incredibly humbling and important for me to experience a third world country like that because it's one of the poorest countries in the world um, and I needed to see that with my own eyes and understand what it was like to have nothing. Two things that particularly stood out to me were visiting one of the students' houses, seeing the reality of their situation. Her guardians had severe disabilities. And then also following some of the students who had malaria as they visited the doctors. A lot of these orphans had lost both parents and their guardians, if they had any at all, had little to no money, um, they, could, they couldn't even afford shoes or clothing. Thank you. Yet, despite all of this, they were some of the happiest, warmest and kindest people I have ever met. I learned that as long as there was hope, that's all you really need. And these kids had hope through being able to go to school and better themselves through education. Education led to better jobs, which led to better pay. And that's the key word, hope. For me, that's what stands out above everything else. Despite the hard circumstances and vast challenges that these children face every single day, they have hopes, dreams and aspirations, just like any other child. I want to be an adult. These students have a hunger to learn and to better themselves through education, and Moet is providing them path to do so. There were also some really amazing moments where I would go off and explore on the weekends. 
Um, I, I remember going to this place called Monkey Bay, um, which is just on the edge of Lake Malawi, and it's so beautiful there, you know. another time where the president of Malawi was visiting. <laughs> I remember jumping on my bike and riding down to go film it. There's a lot of people here and they're all very, very happy. It felt like everyone in the whole area was there and there was lots of singing and dancing. That was absolute chaos, but like joyful chaos. Um, I tried to film a bit closer and then I got told off that you're apparently not allowed to film the president's convoy. A lot of soldiers with guns came over to me, which was a little scary. Um, but I have asked someone and they said that the president is going to drive past the school about one o'clock. So fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fun to experience a different different culture and a different way of life. I left Malawi with a better perspective and understanding of the world. I headed back to Australia for my second year on the working holiday visa, starting work again at the tree nursery. The films I had made at Leon's, in Iceland and in Malawi had all been huge learning curves. The next step in my journey was arguably even more of a challenge for me because I'd arrived at this point where I realised what I wanted to be but I didn't yet know how. How did I become a filmmaker? Like, I had no idea. At the time, I was still watching Ben Brown, Casey Neistat, people like Peter McKinnon, Matty Hapoya. I was slowly learning all the techniques of storytelling, cinematography, all the stuff of how to handle a camera and get the job done. It was all self-taught, but I was still very muddled. I didn't yet know how to get from where I was here at A, to over there at B. I didn't understand how to get paid to do this full time. And then, whilst browsing YouTube, I discovered a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk. Okay, so what are you scared of, failing? Um, not failing, but um, still being at the same place when my friends are at the next level. Huge mistake. You don't want the same thing your friends want. So why the fuck do you care what they have? Now, if you know, you know. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, he basically through the internet became another another mentor for me really. Um, ben Brown, Casey Neistat, they were they were all mentors. The quickest and easiest way to get to do what you want while paying your bills is to start sacrificing leisure and other things and start focusing on monetizing the thing that you want to do in the future. Along with all like the life lessons and the mindset, like all that jazz, I learned a lot of practical things from watching his YouTube videos. Um, and he made me realize that this thing, which was a window into my creativity, Instagram and YouTube, um, it was actually a really powerful tool 
and I could connect with the people that I looked up to. Um, I could find mentors and connect with the right people using this. Search hashtags, click them, look at the account, then see how you can bring them value, DM them, go in soft, bring value, rinse and repeat two, three, four, five thousand times. I'm gonna give you a piece of advice that is 100% and the only reason you won't be successful is because you're not hungry enough and you're too lazy. You ready? Yeah. Good. I want you to go to Instagram. Are you watching me on Instagram? Yeah. Good. I, I want you to stop watching me on Instagram. I want you to start this process. If you're hungry, if you want to win, you have to do for five to seven hours a day. You ready? Yeah. I want you to search a hashtag. I want you to go to the search up top. I want you to search grocery store, local butcher, plumber. When you search it, there'll be a hashtag. And then I want you to spend 25 minutes hitting every picture that has the hashtag plumber and see if it's the account of a plumbing company or a plumber who has a small business. And you see who this is. So this is a custom design firm, B2B commercial in Toronto. 148,000 followers, this is what they post. I want you to then click the URL that is linked to that person's account and look at their website. If they have a good website, leave him alone. If their website is shit, I want you to go back into Instagram and hit the top right corner triple buttons on that right person's profile. You hit send a message, you get Miss D-Rock? Feeling good? Send a message. And then here is the key. And send them a message and say, yo, this is me. I'm the best at small business website design. Your website is not on point. I've got a thing that's 500 bucks up front, 25 bucks a month, and you will crush it and you will return on that investment in one day, let alone one year, because your website will be stronger that you're linked to on Instagram and you'll convert better. The fact you can business develop through this thing now is insane. And if you offer something in return, Three out of 30 people will take you up on it. He may not, but the next person might. And then you business develop and business develop and things start happening. So I was like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll try this, this DM move. You have to remember that uh, at this point, you know, I, I'd studied history. Um, I was a history graduate and I had no formal qualifications in filmmaking, like nothing at all. It was just me as a hobby. It was all self-taught. So I realized, okay, if, if I, if I want to make this work, then I need some some experience and some advice. I need to get closer to the fire, you know? So I got onto Instagram, I searched hashtag filmmaker. Um, I was scrolling through the feeds. I was like, oh, this looks cool. Clicked on a photo, it's a guy like filming out in Africa, filming lions or something. And I was like, yeah, I like this. And I was just digging around his profile, um, just checking out what he did. And then I was looking at the people he tagged and eventually, I came across a guy called Abraham Joff. Abraham, he was basically living my dream job. He was doing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, he was getting paid to travel around the world and tell stories, making beautiful films. He was working with Canon. Um, he owned a production company in Sydney, it turns out. And I was like, ah, Sydney, that's, that's where I am. I'm in Australia. Um, and he had made this incredible series on Netflix called Tales by Light. You need to go check that out right now if you haven't seen it. Um, and it's funny, I'd watched the series without realizing who had made it. And now I was on the Instagram feed of Abraham and I was like, this guy made that series. Um, so yeah, I stumbled across him and I was like, that's me in 20 years, I wanna be him. So I figured, I need to talk to this guy if I can. Um, and I did some more digging. I went on his Twitter because I wanted to try and find the right angle um, to, to message him with. You know, I wanted to actually strike up a real tangible conversation that had him interested. Um, and I went on his Twitter and I realized that he was also incredibly invested in climate change and the environment. And I was like, ah, I just made a documentary, my first documentary about Leon and Kathy and sort of climate change and what they were doing. And I realized like, this is my way in. Like I can connect with him through this. This is my chance. And so I shot him a DM, a direct message. Uh, I dove in, you know? So here we go. I'm gonna read you what I said to Abraham. Hi Abraham, just wanted to reach out to say that I'm a huge fan of your work. You're an inspiration for me as a young filmmaker, so thank you. 
I would love to know if it would ever be possible for me to work with you on one of your upcoming projects for free as an intern, or even just have a meeting to talk with you and gain some priceless insight and knowledge. I read your Ghost of the Arctic interview with National Geographic recently, great article, another beautiful film, and I noticed how you mentioned filmmaking at its best is a collaborative venture. He'd said, it's about surrounding yourself with the right people, I quoted him. That's essentially what I'm trying to do by reaching out to you now. I haven't yet had the chance to work with a film crew and professionals of you and your team's calibre, so the experience for me would be an absolute game changer. In my career as a filmmaker, I'm truly passionate about making films that are going to have a positive impact on our world. I'm not in it for the money, the fame or the legacy. I just know that this is what I'm supposed to do and this is how I can help have a real impact. I have a long way to go in learning the craft and closing the gap between the quality of what I have in my mind and the quality of the work I'm currently producing, but I know I have raw natural talent, creativity, vision and most importantly real passion for all of this. It's all I do and think about. Everything that Untitled Film Works, that's his production company, everything that they've been founded on, the curiosity for the extraordinary, the real life stories that are out there waiting to be told and the key issues that need a voice films that make a difference. I identify with all of this so much. It summed up exactly why I love filmmaking so much. I notice one of those key issues you're particularly passionate about is climate change. It's something I'm equally concerned and passionate about and I even made my own documentary about it. And then I linked him to the video I'd made about Leon and Kathy. Um, I linked him to the one I'd done in Malawi and I said, I hope that these two films and the others I've uploaded to my YouTube channel help to give you an idea of who I am and what I'm about. I would absolutely love to hear back from you. I understand that you're incredibly busy, so I truly appreciate you taking the time and effort to do so. Cheers, Josh. <laughs> that was quite an essay. Sorry, Abraham. <laughs> Must have taken him a good five minutes to read through that. And honestly, I was like, meh. He won't reply, like, I won't get a reply. It's sent, that's it, done. Um, and then, yeah, I was finished at the tree nursery after another season there. So I'd made some savings, I packed my bags, and I flew off to Indonesia, the Bayesians 